thank you very much. Uh, it's wonderful again to be talking to uh, such a, a knowledgeable audience. And uh, I believe, I, I really can say on this occasion, I am dealing with an important story and maybe arguably one of the most important religious stories around in the world right now. It's one that you will have seen something about in different uh, outlets, but I want to pull things uh, together. And as I say here, I'm talking about secularization, the drift away from religion, and the nuns. And please, over the next 40 minutes, if you hear the phrase, the nuns, uh, think of it spelt like that and not N-U-N-S. No actual nuns will be referred to in this, um, in this talk. We're all used to a world in which secularization has advanced quite far in some parts of the world, especially in uh, Europe. But the idea has always been that the United States follows its own trajectory and its own scripts. America is famously a very religious uh, uh, country. It has very high rates of uh, church attendance. And why that's important is that then spills over into uh, politics, into the politics of uh, morality. Uh, and, and if you look up a topic like, you know, white evangelicals and so on, uh, we, we see this um, all over the place. I want to suggest that this is changing very rapidly. And not just that the US is changing somewhat or drifting in a particular direction, but that during the present decade of the 2020s, it will be going through a revolution, a time of secularization, very much like what Europe experienced in the 60s and 70s. And that will have really incalculable consequences on, um, on politics, on public uh, debate, as well as things like uh, provision of you know, social services, social welfare, whatever. This is a revolution uh, in the making. And it's one that a surprisingly few uh, number of people have really picked up on. So first of all, let, let me give you a quote from a very distinguished scholar who died uh, just last year, Ron Inglehart, and listen to this. Since 2007, the United States has showed the largest shift of any country away from religion and now ranks among the world's least religious publics. That's least, L-E-A-S-T, least. Uh, the United States um, now ranks as the 12th least religious country for which data are available. Um, I think we can truly say this is counterintuitive. Uh, Engelhardt does a you know very good job of substantiating uh, what what uh, he was saying. So um, how do we uh, measure this? Now a couple of things. I'm going to be drawing on material from a couple of different uh, sources and databases: General Social Survey, Pew Foundation, Gallup. Uh, doesn't really matter if you see things that are a couple of percentage points different at any given point. Bear with me. It it does not matter a whole deal. There's the trend uh, that, that really matters. So central to this argument is something called the nuns. What are the nuns? If any of those surveys asks people about their religion, somebody may say, I'm a Catholic, I'm an evangelical, or they might say no religious affiliation, which is none, okay? Please understand no affiliation is not the same as atheist necessarily. It does not necessarily mean I have no time for God, uh, but what it means is I'm not, I, I don't formally identify with any uh, religion. It is well known, it is very often quoted that over the past 40 years, certainly, uh, the number of nuns in the United States has grown very substantially. Uh, and th this uh, chart gives you some sort of um, idea. The number was virtually none, uh, pardon the expression, in the 1950s. Uh, by 2010, it reached about 16%. That's one survey. We can look at other surveys, but that's quite a dramatic uh, increase. Um, and this is another one from the Pew. Numbers vary, but, uh, but since 2007, the percentage of adults who say they're atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular in the uh, Pew Center surveys has grown from 16% to 29%. 
That is quite a lot. In fact, if you now take the nuns, they represent America's largest religious group. There are the what people used to say was there are three main groups. There are evangelicals, there are Catholics, there are uh, nuns. The number of Catholics has been <clears throat> falling quite steadily. Um, the number of evangelicals is just about holding steady at about maybe 24%. Uh, the nuns are streaming ahead. And it is almost certain that this number will rise very dramatically, very steadily during the present decade and over the next uh, 25 years. Exactly how far you can predict this is not certain, but one important thing, the number of people who are young, who are under say 25, who are nuns is far higher than for older uh, generations. And something that the Pew Center has argued in its uh, studies is that the habit of having no religion, no religious affiliation, has become what they call stickier, by which uh, they mean, um, if you say that now, you're very likely to say that in 10 years or 15 years, you're not likely to commute back. Now, what is happening here? A number of people, look at these figures and this is a very controversial thing so so what do we have here is this a drift away from religion or is it people acting in exactly the same way as they've always done they're reading the bible they're praying maybe they're even going to church but they're just very unhappy admitting to being an evangelical or a catholic or an anything uh, uh anything in particular and that's a subject of huge controversy. Uh, I have colleagues who I respect enormously who have a very different view from me uh, uh, on this, and we have great, uh, great debates. Um, I believe that a number of things are happening. The first thing you need to know is whenever you see one of these surveys, ask to see the questions, ask to see what was asked, because I can radically change uh, the outcome here just by changing the questions. Give you an example. A recent survey in Great Britain, two surveys came out at the same time. So one survey said that around 50% of British people have some religion. Another survey came out at the same time said that the number was 25%. That is not a rounding error, 25% to 50%. What's the difference? Easy. One survey said, OK, what is your religion? And people said, oh, um, Catholic or Jewish or Hindu. The other survey said, do you consider yourself attached to any religious group? If so, what? In the first survey, people gave an automated response. I'm Catholic or whatever. And then the other one, people were forced to think and said, well, gee, am I a member of this group? Am I affiliated to this group? Eh, not really. And that's how you get a difference between a 50% reporting rate and a 25% reporting rate. It's the same um, thing that happens. Um, if you ask somebody, um, how often do you pray? They'll say, oh, well, from the way the question is phrased, I really should be praying, oh, daily. Uh, alternatively, if you phrase it a different way and say, do you pray? If so, how often? You get an absolutely different response. Part of what is happening with the nuns and with all these religion surveys is not necessarily that people are changing how they act and how they think. It's how they answer uh, questions. Back in the 1950s, uh, it was a very, very big thing to say that uh, you had no religion. So you said you did, even if you didn't. What has changed in the larger society, it has now become much more respectable to say, uh, uh, to say no religion. So um, bear that in mind. Uh, and I particularly think that uh, part of the growth in the nuns is people who 25 years ago would have said, I'm Catholic and I specifically mean Catholic, but over the years have become very annoyed, very angry with the Catholic Church over issues like child abuse and uh, various issues. 
And now they no longer give what you might call a generic or automatic response. And they say, no religion. Now, that might mean they're going to church. It might mean they're praying, but they're answering no religion. So it might be, as some people say, that the growth in the nuns does not reflect the drift from religion and they'll be back. I'm going to argue uh, against that. And uh, once again, uh, some of the uh, evidence of how things are likely to uh, uh, to change. Uh, this takes a couple of the main surveys at Pew and the General Social Survey. Look at those um, graphs and look how they're uh, converging. I mean, in uh, since the early 1970s, America has gone from 90% Christian to 63% Christian. The number of nuns has gone from about 5% to about 29%. That is a whopping change. And the Pew has also done some very good work recently on what's going to happen in the coming years. You don't have to look at the exact details here, but I would just uh, ask you to look at this uh, scenario three. Um, a reasonable bet and this is the most likely one, is that by 2070, okay, that's a long way down the road, uh, over half the population will be none, and around a third would define as um, would define as Christian. I think that's misleading in one way, because that's people who would identify as Christian, but it says nothing whatever about the content of belief. Uh, or how secular those uh, uh, those Christians uh, are. I would argue this is part of a much larger trend in the United States and the West, which is a decisive move away from uh, uh, from religion in general. And I can give you many, uh, many examples of this. Actually, one of, one of the best examples um, I, I, I would give you for such a dramatic shift is not a country, it's the Canadian province of Quebec, uh, which if you have any interest in religion and moves away from religion is such a wonderful case study. In 1963, for example, Quebec was famous as the most religious part of the, the Christian world, certainly. Uh, its levels of mass attendance uh, were about 90%, and they really meant it. Uh, Quebec's Catholic Church was so militant and reactionary uh, that the Vatican regularly used to hand, send messages saying, please cool it, please calm down, don't be so extreme. Uh, and they were on the far, far right of every moral issue and every cultural issue. That was until about 1963, 64, 65. And then over the next decade, it collapsed. Uh, Religious loyalties collapsed, uh, and you see it across the board. You see it in things like, first of all, confessions in the Catholic Church and vocations to the priesthood and uh, mass attendance. And by the 1980s, Quebec was one of the world's most secular societies, and uh, it is far more so now. Uh, the only real exception to that rule is um, immigrants from the French-speaking world, from um, Haiti, from uh, Africa, from Vietnam. If you go into a Catholic church in the uh, province of Quebec, uh, then you'll see many people with these backgrounds, but very few old stock French or Irish uh, Canadians. The reason I mentioned this, this looks like an extreme model, but that has happened with surprising frequency in other countries around the world. Not to quite the same extent, not as quite as rapidly, but that Quebec model should always be in our minds. And I'm going to go far, far out on a limb here, which is I suspect that what we will be seeing in the United States over the next decade or so is a Quebec model. Uh, we will see. How, how far do things go um, after this? I drew your attention to a survey that came out a few years ago, and it still remains a very interesting piece of research. This is the American Physical Society back in 2011, and they 
took uh, census data and uh, survey data from a variety of countries. And again, they went far out on a limb and they said, okay, if you project these for the current century, the 21st century, a number of countries in the world will have no religion at all. Now, the great thing about predicting things 90 years ahead is that by the time these things come to pass, we'll all be dead and nobody can come back and say, so how do you justify that? But the list is very interesting. These were the countries that were secularizing most rapidly. And if you know anything about history or you know anything about religion, it is an amazing list. A number of years ago, if you had to choose the world's most Catholic, most religious countries, where would you start? Ireland and Austria. Ireland and Austria are both on the no religion by 2100 list. The Czech Republic, Finland, the Netherlands, and Switzerland as well. And also Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. Now, please understand, these are countries for which we have um, evidence that you can extrapolate, and we don't in Great Britain. Virtually certainly Great Britain would be on that list if it had the accessible, uh, the uh, uh, kind of accessible uh, data. So some social scientists are not just saying that the secularization shift is a major and ongoing thing, but it, it has an end point. And that end point is, uh, uh, is no uh, religion. Let me focus here on the, uh, uh, on the United States. Um, I've talked about the growth of the nuns. I would say uh, nuns will represent a majority of the US uh, population. I think before 2050, I think it'll be during the 2030s. Uh, things are moving so fast uh, presently, accelerated enormously by COVID and the lockdown, which broke so many people's linkages to churches and religious uh, communities um, in ways that really have not been um, repaired. And once again, you can say, well, uh, to say no re uh, religious affiliation does not mean no religion. That's an absolutely valid comment. But how long can you maintain a religion, a religious faith, a religious identity without some kind of institutional uh, framework, without some sense of going to this particular place on a Sunday or a Friday or a Saturday? And the answer might be a decade, two decades. But at some point, no religious affiliation turns into no religion. And my evidence for that would be some very good surveys that have been done in Europe, where the European Social Survey is just a superb body of, um, uh, uh, of data. And in some particular countries, and the Netherlands is a very interesting one. Right up until the 1960s, the Netherlands used to be a phenomenally religious country. Uh, there were three what were called pillars. You belonged to either the Catholic, the uh, Protestant, or to the secular and socialist. Uh, if you belonged to one of the first two, the Catholic and Protestant identities decided your life, uh, who you talked to, who you married, the papers you read. There were still major Catholic miracles being reported in Amsterdam in the, uh, in the 1950s, but in the 1970s it collapsed. And people moved to this stage of no religious affiliation. The most recent surveys are very interesting. They now show about 25% of the Netherlands as Christian, and 25% not as nuns, but as atheists, people who actively have zero religion. That's not none. So what I'm suggesting on the basis of some of these uh, European um, examples is that the nuns represent an intermediate stage. At the moment in the United States, the number of people who are uh, atheist and agnostic is extremely small. 
Um, I've, got, I, I've got a colleague who does a, um, a, a wonderful presentation that uh, looks at different points in American history and looks at the number of atheists. And so, you know, it's 1850, the number is 4.5%. In 1900, it's 4.5%. And he just shows that it's a fairly steady number all the way through, doesn't change massively, but the number of people with no affiliation does grow. My suggestion, based on these European examples, is that no affiliation segues very naturally over a decade or two into no religion at all. And that is what we are now seeing in large sections of Europe. And let me add, in many other parts of the world, some of the other places that have now very large no affiliation and no religion categories are in Latin America, in countries like um, Argentina, uh, Argentina and uh, Chile and um, Uruguay. You know, we still, I think, in the West have this uh, stereotype of Latin America being very, uh, very religious, very Catholic. A lot of people know there, there's a lot of Protestant growth. Far and away, the fastest growing uh, sections are anti-religious, they are secularist, they are nuns, and they are people of no religion. And think that through when you are looking at debates over things like abortion and homosexuality uh, and euthanasia, and the churches say categorically, this is absolutely unacceptable. Um, that does not reach a great many uh, people. I mean, if you do an analysis of the most recent uh, elections in, um, in Brazil, one of the most interesting things has been the failure of the very powerful, once very powerful Protestant Pentecostal churches to reach uh, uh, anything like the audience that they thought they, uh, uh, they could. So uh, th this, this change is, uh, is significant. Now, I, I can talk at great length in the long term about what is happening here. And by the long term, I mean over the last uh, century or so, I can give you a set of uh, criteria that will predict whether a country is going to be very uh, religious um, or not. I, um, I, I just make these comments very, uh, uh, very, very generally. Uh, if you think of society 100, 150 years ago, a number of things that are now totally different. For one thing, uh, people died much earlier. Um, your, uh, you were much more involved with death in the sense of you're much more likely to have family members who would have died. You know a great deal um, about uh, uh, death. And the churches, religious institutions, clergy, much of what they do concerns death. Uh, they're the ones who provide the good death. These are the ones who are at the deathbed. These are the ones who, in a Catholic context, provide uh, the last rites. These are the ones who are at the uh, uh, at the uh, at the graveside. Uh, I, I say this not as a joke. Uh, one of the great trends in modern history has been the decline of death. We all still die, but most of us do not see death. Uh, death is something that happens normally to very, very uh, old people, usually in medicalized uh, um, settings. Uh, one of the best measures of secularization is a practice that was phenomenally rare in the West up until the late 19th century, which was cremation. Cremation was very, very strictly forbidden in most Western countries uh, in the late 19th century, because it violated so many Christian religious rules about things like the resurrection of the body and so on. Uh, uh, cremation was associated with a few far, far extreme nut groups. There's a very close correlation between the rise of irreligion, the denial of religious affiliation and the rise of cremation. I think Quebec, for instance, is now at about what, uh, 60% uh, cremations, most Western countries. Now. Um, you know, it is unlikely to have something like the traditional situation where a relatively young and seemingly healthy um, adult uh, will be facing death and there will be a clergy man in the older world uh, present and uh, we have lost the culture 
uh, of, um, of death. Uh, if you show me a country's rate of infant mortality, I can give you a very good bet indeed as to how religious or non-religious that country uh, is. That is another of the great social revolutions in modern history over the last 150 years, and it is closely connected with the uh, decline of uh, religious affiliation. These are sort of large things I, uh, I, I can talk about in Q&A. The best predictor of religious affiliation is a country's fertility rate, how many uh, children a uh, woman will have in her life. If it is a very low rate, it is likely to be a very secular country. I talked about this in a talk a year or two ago. I won't go into that right now. Uh, high fertility, high faith countries like in Africa or South Asia, uh, low fertility, low faith countries like in Europe and now the United States. The United States in the last 15 years has passed through a mine, uh, what's called the second demographic transition. Uh, the number of children a typical American woman will have in her life is now down to Scandinavian levels uh, and Scandinavian practices of faith will follow. Again, we can talk about uh, that. When we write the history of American secularization, I think there are a couple of dates we will uh, focus on. One is 2007, 2008, uh, and that is the great um, crash, the great economic uh, crisis. That prevented a lot of family formation, a lot of people who might have set up families, bought houses, had children and so on, and thought, hmm, we must go to church, we must go to a place of worship. They didn't do that. And interestingly, the group that was hardest hit by that was Latinos. Many Americans had said, well, uh, old stock white Americans, yeah, they'll go, they'll lose religion, but Latinos will still be very uh, fervent and pious. Not anymore. Um, Latinos are now very likely to be, uh, to be nuns. Um, huge change in the stereotypes, in the expectations of, uh, 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 of American religion. And the other change, as I said, is 2020, 21, uh, the COVID, the lockdown, and really a massive disruption of institutional religion and the idea of being able to go to a place of uh, worship. I, I would suggest that uh, will still for years to come be discussing the consequences of that in terms of our mental makeup and what that did for concepts of place, presence, physicality, the sense of where we are. Where am I right now? Well, I'm physically in Pennsylvania, but I'm presently talking to people from many different corners uh, uh, of, of the world. Can we worship together? Well, yes, I suppose we can in a sense, but when you lose that physicality, it's a very different kind of experience and commitment. When we come to write the history of American secularization and the decline of American religion, I think we're going to be paying serious attention to that. And I fervently hope that would be the last example of uh, of its kind, I would hate to see uh, hate to see another one. If I was projecting, I would say that most European countries are very far on this trend towards a sharp decline of religion. The United States is different only in the level, only in the sense of being perhaps 20 or 30 years behind. It's not escaping. But this is a trend that also happens in many other countries in the world. And there are some countries in the world that are secularizing so rapidly, it's unbelievable. I just take one example at uh, random. My theory says that low fertility should correspond to low faith. Hmm. In that case, the countries with the lowest fertility in the world, such as South Korea, should be very irreligious. These are the figures. In the decades since two thousand after 2005, the proportion of South Koreans professing themselves Buddhist far from 23 to 16%. That's an incredible drop in a decade. In the same decade, the number of Koreans admitting no religion whatever grew from 47 to 56%. 
there's going to be another survey in 2025 and everyone expects that those figures are going to advance very rapidly. There are many Western Christians who think, ah, less Buddhists, more Christians. Uh, you talk to Christians in Korea, they don't think so. Uh, they see themselves as facing the same secularizing trend and the groups who are growing dramatically um, are, um, are the nuns. What does all this mean? Um, I'd like to present to you what, uh, uh, as a social scientist, I will call the toothpaste argument. There's a, a very fine British sociologist called uh, David Voas, a great scholar of religion. And he argues that there are major transformations such as the Industrial Revolution, the demographic uh, transition, um, that happen once. They don't happen, reverse, happen again, uh, they happen and are irreversible. Um, backtracking is exceptional and temporary, slavery isn't restored, after it's been abolished, nor do women lose the vote once granted. A transition is permanent, not cyclical or recurring. Once out, the toothpaste won't go back into the tube. Secularization is such a transition. That's one argument. And I'm just going to present one statement, which I find very striking and actually uh, really a slap in the face. One of the great scholars of British and European religion is Callum Brown. And he says the Western world is becoming atheist. In the space of three generations, church going and religious belief have become alien to millions. We are in the midst of one of humankind's great cultural changes. Now, uh, can you uh, can you counter this? Well, you know, yes, and I have certainly uh, argued. If you assume that religion perished utterly in England or France or the Netherlands, then there are immigrants. Then there are immigrants from high fertility, high faith uh, countries. If I walk through the streets of Amsterdam with you right now, uh, or on a, um, a Sunday morning, we'll see very few white Dutch people uh, going anywhere near a church. There are a huge number of African migrants who are going to uh, churches. So, in other words, is it a, a death of religion in one segment and its replacement by other ethnic, racial, national groups. And, you know, I, I certainly think that's part of the story. Um, I wonder if it's possible for a society to be, to be without religion, because that society cannot survive without people to do the jobs, pay the taxes, uh, and those people are likely to come from high fertility, high faith uh, countries. So maybe what we've got is a replacement of old stock religion by new stock immigrant religion. That's certainly one possibility. That then leads to, on the third hand, how long can those immigrants maintain their traditional styles of fertility and faith and behavior before they uh, coordinate with the ways of England and France and themselves become uh, uh, more secular. I, I won't go into that into uh, uh, any detail because I, I just don't have the, you know, the basis, the evidence. You you, you certainly see uh, uh, something of this that um, immigrants from other societies uh, do assimilate to the norms of the whole society, of course. But think this through just in the context of the United States. Think so of how much coverage of politics and culture and law is predicated on the idea of very large and largely conservative religious populations, white evangelicals who are often demonized, Catholic politics who are very, uh, uh, are very important. And imagine those in a world where the amount of religious commitment and behavior is massively less than it is now. That is nothing less than a political and a cultural uh, revolution. When a story emerges from something like the Pew Center uh, about the growth of nuns, 
then many people write stories and say, you know, this is what's happening in 2070. And uh, people uh, make polite comments and say, gee, how interesting. And everyone makes a standard joke about nuns, not nuns, N-U-N, giggle, giggle. I think this is something of really extreme importance. And I would say, if you are interested in the coverage of religious stories as such, this is one of the most important topics in the world. And I just want to uh, quote a very uh, famous poem. Um, Federal law requires that any account of secularization has to include a quote from Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach. And I'm going to uh, do it. He wrote this about uh, 1851. And he imagined being on a beach and uh, he saw the uh, the tide go out. And he wrote this, um, then he wrote this. The sea of faith was once too at the full and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy long withdrawing roar retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. That phrase, the long withdrawing roar, has probably been used as a quote in about a thousand uh, journal articles and book titles, and it's awfully well known. So please forgive me using something which is, uh, which is so well known. But when I look specifically at the United States, not just Europe, at the United States, I think I do see a melancholy long withdrawing roar of faith and faith in politics. And if you have any interest in the topic of religion, that to me is a you know very, very serious and um, and important topic. So um if I may, I will uh I will wind up at that point. I will um I will stop uh sharing and I will hand over for any uh QA or discussion. Wow, Dr. Jenkins, I mean, it's such a, so many things as I was taking notes, so many things just really stood out um, from what you've said and shared. And it, and I think just the, the case and argument you've made is, is so clear that this is such a big topic, a big religious topic for the next decade. I would love to open it up for questions for anybody who would like to, to ask any questions. And you can use the hand emoji to raise your hand. Um, but would love to have questions from you all. I'm sure you have some. If it's easier for you to put them in the chat, you can do that as well. Okay, Didi. Can you hear us, Didi? Your hand is raised. And I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly or Didi. Not hearing. Not sure. Maybe, maybe some issue with the connection there. Anyone else have questions at this point? I thought it was so interesting what you said about the lost culture of death. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting because my mom passed away in my mid twenties, and it was um, very. And I apologize; I'm in a place that's a little loud. Um, my mom passed away in my mid twenties, and it was, um, you know, just becoming very well acquainted with death at a young age. I felt very out of place in my generation among my peers. Sure. Um, but to think about that as a society, we are experiencing that—that that there's not this natural age progression that we had before, where people started dealing with the recognizing their mortality at a younger age. Uh, right. So I think that's really fascinating that we just don't experience death as much as a culture. And that also, of course, gets to the fertility thing. So, for instance, if you know you're likely to be dead before 40 or 45, that obviously decides, uh, makes you decide when you're going to have children. So you're much more likely to start having children at 17 or 18 because you're more likely to see them grow up. Uh, many women uh, today leave having children till their mid-30s. That would be almost literally a suicidal prescription in earlier societies because uh, you would probably die before your children were in their teens. Um, so 
you know, everything is uh, uh, connected um, uh, uh, in that way. What does that have to do with religion? Well, we can talk about that uh, uh, more, but um, there has been a decline of death. It sounds a very stupid thing to say, but the role of death has changed uh, uh, so uh, so dramatically. In earlier societies, very, very likely you had multiple siblings and a number of them died. And you, um, you, uh, uh, you knew this death was unavoidable. Fascinating. Okay, Dr. Nitsky Nikoko in South Africa. Not hearing. <laughs> I know we're having a little trouble. Okay, analyze. I can see. I can see four hands up. <laughs> I know. And I'm, I'm. I'm not. I'm uh, not sure if they can hear. Yeah. Uh, okay, Anna, analyze. Oh, so frustrating. So interesting. I know we have questions to ask. Um, let me see if anyone's put anything in the text. We do in the have, chat, um, and let's have right here. Yes, there is something in chat from Elias. Uh, okay. Can, can innovation save religion? What I see with some churches is that sticking to traditional services and evangelism will will see faith swallowed by the trappings of modern technological changes. Yeah. Okay. Let me uh, let me deal with that. I can see that both ways. Um, so you uh, you might say, for example, um, staying with traditional services offers people a kind of face to face personal experience that they can't get through uh, 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 through uh, technology. Uh, um, Religion was actually one of the first things that got onto uh, uh, the internet. I, uh, I sometimes say that uh, religion took to the internet as a duck takes to orange sauce. It was very tempting, but also uh, very dangerous in, uh, uh, in lots of ways. Um, I would also add uh, one other thing in terms of adaptation. Uh, religion also has to adapt to a very different demographic um, profile. You know, so many... Uh, churches, synagogues, uh, look at youth programming. Well, just assume they reach a stage where they've written off almost youth because they're not going to be getting much more by way of youth. Uh, and what about focusing on new ways of dealing with the old and the, uh, uh, the ultra uh, old? Okay, uh, Didi, pardon the expression, uh, Gimekis, um has a couple of questions. Let me just deal with one. How do you see the expansion of Islam in relation to your presentation? Very interesting. I've argued for a very close uh, linkage between falling fertility, sharply falling fertility, and secularization. Over the last 30 years, the countries in the world that have had the sharpest falls in fertility have all been Islamic. And the suggestion is that that uh, portends a real secular shift in those countries. The most striking example mm -hmm. being Iran. Iran has had uh, the sharpest, fastest fall in fertility ever recorded, which would lead one to believe a major change in the role of uh, women, as I've argued for a good number of years, and I'm fascinated to see that I Iran is currently in the middle of what you can only call a women's political and social uh, uh, revolution. It would be interesting if the present regime collapsed, because I suspect that the new regime that would emerge would not only be, we hope, more democratic, but also much more secular. Iran has 60,000 mosques, 3,000 of them are in use. Um, it runs in the middle of a major kind of uh, kind of secular shift. Um, there are other countries where Islam assuredly is growing in very very conservative uh, style. Um, high fertility, uh, uh, high faith, and th there was also uh, there are also a couple of other questions I'm seeing here earlier in the chat. Uh, the chat. May I pick up on a couple of those? Yeah, let's see if real quickly, um, Mindy, did you have a question? Yes, sorry. Um, I was just going to ask you, Dr. Jenkins, I, I mean, I, I just while you were talking, I picked up my very well-marked copy of The Lost History of Christianity, <laughs> which I think you wrote in the 2007-2008 period that you yeah. highlighted. And 
I and, and this maybe dovetails with your comments on Islam, but uh, you know, you reflected there so well and deeply on the golden age of Christianity in what we now think of as the Muslim world and the mm -hmm. Middle East. And I, I just wonder if you would talk a little bit about whether what we see now in the West is similar to the decline of Christianity in the East, or is it different if there are very specific ways for sort of markers for the rest of us who are trying to see historical comparisons and contrasts? Yeah, I, I would say it's very different in one key way, because in that earlier period, what you had was a major competing religious traditions. Uh, so in most cases, um, you know, Muslim regimes were not necessarily trying to stamp out Christianity, but uh, that was the net effect of, um, of what happened. Um, in the modern West, it is not the story that you have a, um, a competing uh, religion that is in any sense uh, persecuting uh, uh, Christianity in a country like the Netherlands or the, uh, uh, or the United States. Um, so you might have uh, ri rival traditions, but that all the decline is, if you like, coming from, uh, uh, coming from within. Uh, it, it is struggles over issues in the, uh, in the larger culture, in the role of family, the uh, the role of women, attitudes to um, sexuality, uh, and, and that is what is driving so much of the change. So it's a fundamental uh, co um, contrast in that way. Uh, in the Middle Ages, the question is: people are still going to be very religious, but are they going to be very religious Christians or very religious Muslims? The question in the modern um, era is living without religion in any institutional sense at all. And you might say after that, well, people can still hold very religious and superstitious uh, uh, ideas that are unconnected to an institutional religion. And that's, that's perfectly possible. So um, the it's, it's a different concept of, uh, uh, of decline with much deeper rooted cultural, demographic, social um, foundations. Whether it is going to be as lethal is an open question. Super right. helpful, thank you. Thank you, Mindy. And Eliza, did you have a question? Oh, hello. Yes, thank you so much for this uh, presentation. My goodness. Uh, um, uh, I, one of the things I've been reflecting on uh, while listening to you is um, in the early days of, um, uh, of Gegrefer and uh, uh, the International Media uh, Project, we used to talk quite a bit about all the advantages of, as, as journalists of our own um, uh, religious uh, uh, connections and, and, and affiliations. And one of the things um, that you know, I'm curious about is the, that with the decline in, um, uh, in um, meeting together um, on, a, on a regular basis, um, the, this sort of loss of intergenerational connection. Mm. And um, I'm just I'm curious yes. if there's been any, any work on work on that. Oh boy, uh, there may well have been, but I I I, I could not cite uh, uh, that uh, that right now. Um, it it does get to um, you know the, the sense of um, a the role of a church or a congregation of any kind as an extended family in an era when extended families are much uh, rarer. So, for example, you know, my uh, my wife and I are both um, only uh, children. You know, we, we we don't have stacks of siblings and so on. But through the church we attend, we have a sense of the organic growth and development of a community and people die and people join and people move on. If you don't have that physical in place contact and you talk to people at the key event of church which is coffee hour do not hit me um then you you lack uh, a great deal of that and so much of the uh, that kind of intergenerational contact for uh, uh for kids and um and grandkids uh very very important uh very important topic 
Yeah, I just, I just, because we're always thinking in terms of stories and coverage. Right. You know, I, I, I just think that that might be an interesting kind of hook, you know, or way yeah. in. I talk about it, especially I would say with the interest in um, the hyper local. And there's so much talk about community, but actually, if you look at certainly here, you know, in my corner of, of Canada, you know, the local communities, it, it, there's very little intergenerational contact. That you know, there's lot, lots of sort of older people meeting together. Do you know right. what I mean? So I, anyway, I, I'm just sort of thinking aloud here as a, a you know possible well, avenues for stories. I, you know that is a terrific one, but yeah, um, I, I will give you an, an example of that. So much of communication for younger people is in social media that older people find utterly incomprehensible. Absolutely. Uh, I, 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 I just give you an um, example. Uh, I, I was involved in. Um, one uh, uh, group uh, discussion um, and somebody suggested, oh, we should continue this through a WhatsApp group. Now, these are all very educated, very smart people. And there was a straight age divide at 30. And everyone under 30 said, oh, great idea. And everyone else said, what? Interesting. And these are people like, you know, multiple doctorates and very attuned to the world. <laughs> What's what's up? So interesting. Quick question from Tori. He was asking, do you see any chance that future crises can change the trajectory of religion, such as hunger, climate change, et cetera? Yeah. yeah. Uh, interesting. Uh, climate change is one that I've uh, uh, worked on quite a lot. And I actually think it will have a huge religious impact, uh, particularly in driving migration from very high fertility, high faith, countries in Africa or South Asia uh, and people coming to Europe and to North America. So in that sense, um, to, to, uh, to use the famous phrase, what uh, happens in Africa does not stay in Africa. It comes to Italy and Britain and, um, and Germany. Um, so yes, I would certainly see that. Whether that would have an impact on what you might call old stock white people in Germany or Britain in the United States, um, I, um, I don't think so. Now, I'm not talking here about, you know, cataclysms and there are, you know, nuclear explosions and we're living in a new dark age because that, that's beyond any kind of bounds of, uh, of prediction. But I would see the uh, climate especially uh, as driving the kind of uh, migrant focused religion that I was talking about. So societies like Switzerland will not be without religion. It'll be a very fervent kind of religion. It'll be Islam, it'll be Christianity, uh, but it will be uh, African religion. Yeah. So a small thing, by the way, um, you know, everyone uh, is focused on what's happening in Ukraine right now, rightly so. When I was writing about Ukraine in the late 1990s, it was very easy to write about the population. It was 50 million. When the present war started, it was 45 million. Does that give you an idea just in 20 years or so, that it went from 50 million to 45 million, as one of the most wow. rapid contracting populations in the world, quite apart from war and refugees. You know, we're living in a time of dramatic contraction in old stock European populations. Uh, so will there be new religions? Yes, but there will be more immigrant. Okay, I Didi, did you have a question? And I apologize if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Still Did you have a question, Didi? Shoot. Okay, Dr. Nziki, no coco. Uh, oh, thank you so much, Melissa. I'm back on another device, so you can hear me now. Yes. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, you know, this topic is critical because yeah. it, it, it's, it's bringing, it, it brought me to a, a, a point of um, going back. Let me go back and be on the, on the Bible because we know we're all Christians. This is a Christian uh, forum. It brought me to that, will we ever be united? It brought me back to the statue of Daniel. Ah. It, brought, it brought me back to the signs of the times. Mm. 
Mm. We all we grew up in the church in a very formal religious church that was a church that came through to the African continent through bureaucracy and education, economics, colonization. So this took me to seeing that this is a, another lecture that is so pregnant and broad mm. because it, it, it's, it's bringing us to back to how we were even colonized in Africa. Mm. And shall we ever, it, it takes us to the bottom line of what we're normally saying, it's hard questions. It's not hard questions, it's real questions that we have to ask. There's nothing hard when we're dealing with reality. Mm. We're talking about values, we're talking about culture, we're talking about how our freedom and liberation were taken away, even the way we were worshipping as Africans. So will we ever unite? Are these the signs of the times? Uh, again, you know, I'm putting this as a salad to you, because you see, it's different topics you can take us through again. I'm in another big forum where it's a, a continent, almost all continents. It's led by USA Business Forum. They are also Christian based and they are also in politics. So I was listening carefully today. In this, Christians are in politics. It was like that even in the Bible. Mm -hmm. The prophets and the pro patriarchs were leading the economy of the country. Joseph led the economy. Daniels were leading in the king's palaces, but they never lost their culture and values of Christianity. How do we then write these articles in this modern um, era that we live in? Now we are also under after pandemic, we were distracted to be at home. Now we are worshiping online. Mm -hmm. And the traditions of the bureaucracy are breaking because we broke away from the traditional churches that I would make examples of your Anglican, Methodist, and Catholic that came to colonize us in Africa. We are not even taking back our authority and authenticity as Africans to say we believed in God in Africa, but we were colonized and we were told how to do things. We want to be and we are back in our values and culture as Africans. So that's what we come across. If I come and say I preach in the Bible, this, that, Somebody says, woe unto me, take away your Bible. It was given through colonization and your freedom taken away. How do we navigate to the unity as the body of Christ? Mm. Thank you so much for that. Let I, I would just say one thing. I mean, you, you obviously raised so many uh, uh, issues, but, you know, for many years, uh, I, I have worked very hard on uh, the topic of Christianity in, uh, in Africa, um, initially because I thought it was such an exciting topic, but increasingly because I think it is uh, a very large part of the future of uh, Christianity, and that if you don't understand uh, Africa and its dilemmas and uh, 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 its roots, uh, then you're missing, as the phrase goes, the heart of the matter. Uh, by uh, by 2050, uh, by far the largest Christian continent will be Africa, when for the first time there will be over one billion Christians uh, on one continent, which will be one third of the global uh, uh, population. The faster Christianity and religion generally decline in the West, in Europe and North America, uh, the more central that African tradition becomes. That's great. Thank you so much. Kingsley Paul was asking, why is Europe, which had a strong legacy of Christianity, becoming more atheistic? I think you touched on a couple of these points, yeah. but overall, do you have a sense of why in Europe particular that's happened? Um, I relate it very strongly to uh, demographic change. There is something called the uh, the second demographic transition, which is when you move to very 
uh, low fertility um, societies, total change in the relation of women to the church, of families to the church. You take children out of the picture, so children no longer bind people to established religion. That demographic tradition begins in Northern Europe, in Scandinavia, it spreads over Protestant Europe and then Catholic Europe. And that whole story happens between about 1963 and 1980. Uh, and you can see the demographic transition and the faith tradition, secularization, hitting together. And you can uh, map it very precisely through a long series of legislative debates and referenda over things like what? Divorce, contraception, abortion, uh, uh, euthanasia. Uh, and that transition maps almost precisely the demographic uh, uh, transition. The change in values can be mapped precisely. And very recently, uh, in the last few years, uh, that's happened in um, Ireland. Tamiya Society's uh, fertility rate, and I'll tell you where it stands on the secularization uh, spectrum, and Europe is the clearest example of that. And for many years, people said, yeah, well, this is just Europe. It won't affect the rest of the world. Oh, yes, it will. Oh, yes, it does. And not just in the white and Western world. Uh, that became a global story in East Asia and, uh, and Latin America. I was deliberately not saying much about that because I talked about that in a talk here a couple of years ago. But that's, for me, the big reason uh, why Europe leads the way. And Americans used to say, hmm. Why is America totally different? No, it isn't. Wow. Um, but also was asking, what are some of the challenges in measuring the nature and extent of secularization? Sure. Well, as I said, the first thing is you have to be extremely careful with uh, what you are measuring. You have to be careful to know the questions. Um, and uh, so if somebody says, um, you know, what, what, uh, what is your religious affiliation? None. Many people will go away and report that as that is the number of atheists. Well, no, it isn't. It's a totally different thing. So you have to uh, get the, uh, you have to achieve verbal precision. What is asked, what is um, answered. Um, and uh, you also have to be careful to judge between what people say and what is the case. You know, there's a famous series of studies about, um, the number of Americans who say they go to church on a Sunday versus the number who really actually do. It's, it's, it's a well-known thing. But one thing that has happened in the last 20 years is that people are less likely to say that they go to church because it's become acceptable so to do. So you have to remember, when you base yourself on social surveys, you have to know what those social surveys can and cannot say. Uh, it, so, I, 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 and that's, a, you know, I think a lesson, particularly for journalists, because people are often very honest, and well-intentioned, and they mean to report uh, in a non-tendentious way, but they don't totally understand what the evidence uh, is giving you. That's great. Didi, I think he may have just popped up, but he did say, thank you so much for the presentation. I'm very much motivated to study religion toward my PhD. Huh. Um, he did have a question before that the Western culture is a biblical culture. Do we really fear the danger of too much secularization? Boy, um, let me suggest that if you're in a culture which is very kind of, uh, uh, you know, religiously um, infused, it becomes uh, very easy to um, ad um, uh, adopt these uh, ways. And uh, the, the, the more religion is removed from the culture, uh, the harder it is to get that. But think also of the uh, policy consequences. Uh, look at Europe, for example. Uh, in the early days of the secularization in Catholic countries, uh, the big issue was, uh, big issues might have been, uh, you know, can there be contraception, can there be divorce, and these are what you might call libertarian issues. As you move along, then the focus changes to much, much more sensitive things like um, euthanasia. Um, and uh, where the churches say uh, flat out, this is unacceptable, this is, uh, this is evil. Um, and yet large majorities of people are sufficiently secular to say, no, that's, that's fine. Um, 
how far are you prepared to go with um, societies passing laws and having policies that you might find not, not just unacceptable for yourself, but absolutely evil? Mm. So um, everything I'm talking about here, if it was just a case of religious practice and the fact that you may see your beloved church uh, sold off to become a... Um, a, 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 an apartment or a warehouse or a store okay that's very sad but we're talking about the whole basis of policy and politics in your um, in your country uh, and some of those things are going to be things you would probably be very troubled by uh, indeed and where we're seeing that a lot in European countries now is in uh, transgender uh, issues for example which, by the way, would, would be a great topic for a future uh, e event uh, for the media project is how some of these debates show up. Maybe next year's. Maybe we've got next year's se session with you, Dr. Jenkins. I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Paul Marshall, your colleague yeah. at Baylor, a dear friend Lovely. of yours as well. I'm sure he has a few questions possibly to round out our time together. And if anybody else has any more questions, they can put that in the chat. And then our intern, Evan, is going to close us out with details about tomorrow. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Marshall. Thank you, Melissa. OK, um, th thank you, Melissa. Um, as you know, um, I'm one of those people who would say, you know, you know, what's WhatsApp type of person. So in terms <laughs> of any technology around this call, I hope I, I might be useless at it. Um, but let's see. Let me just check the chat if there's anything up there. Um, I, I have, uh, boy, I have a whole raft of questions and, and, and comments, but uh, just one anecdote. This was about 20 years ago um, in a session with the late Samuel Huntington, sure. uh, probably the sort of leading political science professor in the last um half of the 20th century in um, the United States. And um, he had been arguing that uh, the presence of uh, Christianity uh, was fundamental to the development of democracy, mm. at least in the Western world. And I asked him, I said, does that mean with the de-Christianizing of the Western world, it will cease to be democratic? And he was silent for about 15 seconds and then just said, yes. Um, so uh, that would, you know, I think that will be one of the longer term um, or even shorter term consequences. Anyway, that's, that's one thought. Uh, a few things hit me, um, you know, because you know, one of the things you, you were saying is the relation with uh, death, where we're now, death is now hidden. Um, so is birth. I mean, still around for the birth, but there's fewer of them. Yeah. So we're becoming um, very disembodied. Yes. Uh, Good words. Uprootedness, and then I think our relation to technology, um, our distance from the world is. Um, affecting our um i think that's one reason for the de-religionization but two connected things and this gets into transgender you know very much a disembodied thing yes. you know my body has no necessary connection to who i am so I, this seems to be um a further step and then uh, tying into another thought which i'm sure you've thought about a lot is the question is, is, you know, is there less religion or is it just a different religion? And enough people in talking about this disembodied uh, idea of we have this identity floating around somewhere within us and the body is um, uh, not necessarily connected. Um, is this a form of Gnosticism? Mm, yeah. You know, we are, we're really these spirits drifting around. And again, this is sort of uh, becoming further disembodied. That's just a um, series of, of, of thoughts, if you have any reaction to that. Yeah, 
you know, um, when I would teach uh, very introductory religious studies, I would always have a class on the phrase, my body. So you can uh, talk about my leg, and that makes good sense. But if you say there's my body, it suggests that there's a me there, which is separate from the physical uh, body. And I think your point about uh, disembodiment is central to so much of this and it applies exactly to what i'm saying about uh, the idea of um online uh, worship the effects of the uh, uh, the pandemic and as you absolutely rightly say uh, th that relates very closely to the transgender issues which are going to be so critical for all churches and religious bodies over the next decade i apologize for using the word body uh, again in that context um no uh, th there is a, a deep uh philosophical um anthropological basis uh to to what you're saying and and these uh, uh these larger uh trends in a sense we're talking about a denial of the body and maybe a denial of life in a, 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 any concept a, a, any way that we uh uh think of and if you move human interaction from the face to face from the embodied to social media on, online that just accelerates that dramatically have the churches thought about this my answer is no mm -hmm. thank you um there's a, a, a note from uh annalisa saying that um uh where is it uh marshall uh McLuhan could be helpful here on talking about that and, and uh McLuhan used to teach at uh, St. Michael's College, University of Toronto, which is where Annalisa is um, right now. Annalisa, do you want to um, add something to that? She's still there. Uh... No. Oh, hi, hi, yeah. Sorry, well, actually, um, not, not uh, you know, not, you know, not really, uh, other than to say, we're, uh, just picking up on this idea, has the church thought about these things? Um, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I really am just, uh, you know, a, a very sort of temporary visiting fellow there, but I, I love listening in and I've taken part in some interesting um, discussions with uh, both undergraduate and grad students. And I would say that actually, there is quite a bit of wrestling going on um, with theologians on, on this issue there. So it, that might be a future uh, you know, avenue to, uh, to think about. Um, actually during COVID, um, I, I took part of, in a um, symposium uh, with some, uh, you know, very, um, it was very moving actually to hear students reflect on the effect of COVID on their, on their studies. Um, and, uh, you know, again, you know, drawing on that legacy of McLuhan and, um, you know, more, you know, those who are kind of sort of you know, taking up his, uh, his mantle. So yeah. anyway, I've really, thank you. I've, I've, I've been very inspired by the discussion today and it's been uh, far too long since I've, uh, I've been part of this uh, cohort. So many, many thanks. Well, lovely, thank you. Okay, if if I I could just add for you go, Annalisa, and we all probably have to go soon. Uh, but I've got so much. Uh, when you mentioned McLuhan, I think it's uh, important to add that he was a very serious Catholic. Yeah. Uh, which oh, is often absolutely. Not, yeah. Very much often not commented on. No, um, no, I, no, absolutely. In fact, um, there's a wonderful book. I can send the link. Um, I, I I I did review it when it came out. Um, uh, Obviously, posthumously, uh, his son Eric McLuhan edited it. Was uh, Marshall McLuhan on religion? Yeah, oh. I, I reviewed it for the Chicago Tribune um, oh, well, in a conversation that. with McLuhan, where, where some of these issues are raised. So I'll stick the link in, and um, yeah. Anyway, thanks all. That would be interesting. Yeah, and if I I could add another serious Catholic, though very unorthodox one, uh, and Canadian Charles Taylor. Uh, yeah, yeah got in, into um, many of these themes as um, <clears throat> as why religion or religion as we've known it is disappearing. Mm. Um, but yes. it just struck me in your comments earlier. <clears throat> uh, he's a Quebecer. Ah, yes. So he watched this um, <clears throat> uh, very much when in his early years as a professor at McGill. Yep. So. Yeah. Oh, are, there, are there more um, comments? I'm taking too much of the time here. Oh, no, comments nice. or questions? 
Okay, then if not, uh, uh, Philip, thank you very much for a, uh, a very fascinating talk. And for myself, I could stay on here for another couple of hours, except we've got other things to do. Uh, Evan, can I turn this over to you for com um, introduction for tomorrow? Yes, yes, you certainly can. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen on that now. Just give me a second. Just use the WhatsApp group. Yeah, just use WhatsApp. Evan's, Evan's ahead of all of us with all of that. <laughs> all right, yeah, so uh, everyone can see this, I'm guessing? Yep. Okay, yeah, well, obviously we uh, all were present for today's session, which was excellent. Uh, and tomorrow we're going to be rounding things off with Jill Geisler. You'll remember her from Monday. Uh, and she, she's going to be doing a session on positive feedback and tough conversations in both the general professional workplace, but specifically regarding the journalistic workplace. It's going to be an interactive conversation. You get practical tips, guidance on navigating uh, those difficult conversations. We'll end with, as we've done throughout the week, a question and answer period. Uh, you can ask Jill any questions that you can think of about leadership and journalism. Um, and we're also going to have Melissa back. Uh, and obviously, uh, she's incredibly thoughtful and talented. So I'm really going to be looking forward to hearing that. Uh, we hope to see everyone there. But uh, thank you all so much for coming today. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow morning. Thanks, okay. Evan. Thank you very much. And Philip, thank you very much again. And for those of you who have tuned in, thank you very much. And Thanks for the hospitality. Thank you. Okay, goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.